Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the first Visiting Artist Talk in our speaker series this June. Uh, I'm Ben Sloat, the director of the MFA and Visual Arts program here at Leslie. Uh, the overall thematic of this residency has been temporality as value, and it considers the significance of various forms of impermanence within the larger artistic experience. Our series began yesterday with a faculty presentation by Deborah Davidson in conversation with Emily Evelish, and continues in the coming days with talks by Helen Molesworth, Letha Wilson, and Andy Graydon. Matt Saunders, uh, tonight's speaker, has a painting-based practice that extends into photography, installation, and animation. Uh, in his earlier works, Matt sourced imagery from cinematic moments, producing sequence paintings, which he describes as having, quote, layers of temporal and physical remove. In these works, his paintings become infused with the elusive resonance of a time-based medium. In more re recent works, Matt has made photographic negatives with painting materials which subsequently enter a color, a color analog printing process. In other projects, sequence painterly imagery are translated into animations, often projected on an architectural scale. In these various gestures, Matt seems to be embracing fugitive spaces between artistic mediums. In an interview, he stated, I strive to embody the fleeting images, to embed them inseparably in their materials and have them speak of those materials. Matt's work has been presented in group exhibitions at MoMA New York, Whitney Museum, Mass MoCA, Drawing Room London, Deutsche Guggenheim, SF MoMA, Aspen Art Museum, and the 10th Charge Biennial, among many others. He has had one person shows at the Renaissance Society of Chicago, the Tate Liverpool, uh, Tank Space in Shanghai, and the St. Louis Art Museum. His work is represented by Blum & Poe Los Angeles, Tokyo, and Marion Goodman Gallery, New York, London, Paris. Uh, he teaches at Harvard University and is based in Cambridge and Berlin. Uh, please join me in welcoming M Matt Saunders. Hi, everyone. Um, will you let's see. please holler if you can't hear me? I have a very quiet voice sometimes, especially when I trail off absent mindedly. Um, well, thank you, Ben. Thank you for um, having me here. I can't believe I'm here again. Uh, it's, I, I, I guess it's been seven years, but it seems like just yesterday. So my apologies to all the friends in the audience who have seen this before. Um, and I'm going to show, I'm going to give a talk about painting, um, although this slide will show you a little bit uh, how that might swing off of uh, what one's expectations might be around painting. Um, and I, I'm very torn between two uh, polls here. I, because it's a school setting, because of the um, intensity of this residency, I really um, believe in showing early work and showing a lot of vulnerability and trying to be um, very open about the, all of the problems in one's practice. Um, I also don't want to totally bore you. And so I've done something a little bit strange. Normally I would, uh, because I have a painting practice that really has grown from one thing to the next kind of continuously, normally I give a talk that's like, I did this, and I did this, um, with some development. Instead, I thought that um, I would organize my talk around five, uh, five questions I have about painting that I think are, are playing out in my work, so that each question will range from some, ver some student work, 20-year-old work, um, to some uh, recent things. So just to give you a quick sense of the sorts of things that, uh, the sorts of ways that I work, because um, a lot of times, uh, the first questions people have are, are material, um, and it's actually quite simple. I work um, often with a, very, with a set of very analog processes. Um, so this is, these are shots of a show I did at the Tate uh, in Liverpool, um, and you can see that these are silver gelatin prints. They're large prints. Uh, they're painterly, and in fact, um, and they're unique, and I would call these things paintings. I call it, this is really my practice of painting. Um, but they're made. Um, in this case, by uh, putting light through a painting. So I'm basically painting a negative on canvas. I'm just painting the opposite of what I want, um, turning off the lights, putting a sheet of paper, a photo paper under it, and exposing it. Um, so I just wanted to show you a few of these images to give you a taste of the vocabulary that I've centered around for the last 15 years or so. It's often figurative, um, although not always. When it's uh, abstract, it's always very specific about its materiality, um, often a kind of estranged and, and kind of transformed sense of materials. Um, it's a lot of process thinking and, and process-based working in my practice. Um, and you know, there's a balance between, uh, well, abstraction and figuration, but um, between maybe the surface of a screen and the sort of density or, or um, opacity of, uh, of a traditional painting. So, 
the first the first thing that really I think is central to my my work in general is this question of how making is it itself a form of perception. Um, when I was starting out, I was really allergic to a kind of painting which was you make a brushstroke, you make another brushstroke, and you and you add up to an image. There was something deeply unsatisfying to me about that. That felt like illustration. It felt like um, uh, something that any you know anything could be trained to do. Um, I was much more interested in work that I thought of as uncanny, as having a kind of untouched by human hands quality or some kind of intensity that was gestalt at the same time as being individualized. Um, and I. I really am um, not interested in making images, although my work is very image-based. I'm really interested in the way that trying to make images by hand or trying to make images um, uh, in a physical way is an embodied form of investigation and knowledge and has to do oftentimes in my work with how we perceive very, um, very immaterial, very intangible things. Even from, here's work from 1998, um, even my very first uh, paintings um, I was working with, from moving image sources. This is uh, from Andy Warhol's Trash. Uh, it's Joe D'Alessandro. And there's this moment um, when this character, who's a junkie, is standing naked in a shower, being watched by other people, completely tense and vulnerable on display. And then he, um, he starts shaving, and you see all of his muscles relax at once. And I was really fascinated by these kinds of non-scripted performances in films, um, very specific films at that time. Um, and whether you could capture that or whether you could perceive that, that subtle shift between performing and being um, in these moments. And so I was using a Polaroid camera, I was shooting directly off the television, and I was making paintings to try to ca catch images faster than I could think about them and then try to paint them to understand them. So there were these sort of sequences working through looking at something, which went in tandem with these much stagier works. I was, if I was identifying a kind of um, engagement with the image through Watching it off the TV screen, I also was aware of the public form of these types of characters. So I was collecting publicity stills. I was making this very, very um, kind of work. There's a Zardoz fan. There's Sean Connery and Charlotte Rampling down there. Um, these, these drawings with ink on mylar that were uh, trying to think about mannerism and the connection between that, that way of kind of hyper control um, and how that relates to publicity and celebrity. Um, I got really frustrated with that way of drawing. I'm going to show about 90 images, so I'm going to talk pretty quickly. Um, so sorry for that. Um, but I kind of killed my relationship to drawing in these drawings because I became really too uptight with them, and I became too um, facile with using these materials. And this is a kind of recurring thing in my, in my practice about when I feel like I can do something, then I always want to sort of tie my arm to my side or do something else. Um, so this was a drawing project that was really just about loosening up, um, and it was based upon a short sequence of um, a film that I was interested in. It was a 14-second clip at the very beginning of a film um, called Shameless by an Austrian director in the 60s, and it shows this character coming into focus um, from a black screen. And I was using the materials, this, this ink on Milo that made these very sharp edges, had a certain way of functioning um, in relation to edge and form, and I was interested in um, you know, thinking about how those 14 seconds were actually composed of several hundred stills, and did I have the patience to draw all of those stills individually, and um, could I find analogous ways with my materials to do something as simple as a photographic out of focus? So the lens goes out of focus, but how do you make a drawing go out of focus? That was one question. So maybe really try to perceive what focus meant. And then the other was, um, I'm working with an object. This object is a piece of is a piece of moving image, um, and it consists of this body of stills. So how do I keep that body intact, and how do I work my way through that whole body? How do I look at it and understand it differently? Um, this actually, uh, I thought it was going to be a group of drawings. I ended up reconstituting it actually as an animation. So it replay, it played in this uh, window in Geneva originally. Um, does that all make sense so far? Um, so that's, this is all, that's all really old work, but just to show you that I'm still fascinated with this idea of kind of trying to see with your hands or in the dark. This is work from about a month ago, which I realized putting this together I don't have good pictures of. You can't really see what's going on here. But these are Marais pictures. This is, um, these are photograms of a painting of a, of a swamp um, on very thin chiffon, and I'm folding it and tossing it and bunching it up. So in these things in person, there's actually an incredibly kind of psychedelic marae happening. So these are pictures that are very hard to see and they're very hard to, to look at. And I, I haven't shown them. I haven't gone anywhere with them that feels adequate. But I'm, I'm in the dark room right now trying to figure out how to make a picture that swims in front of my eyes and 
and is active in that kind of way. In the same way that um, this is a recent animation from last year where I'm um, making, this is just a still from it, but I'm making drawings and then I'm blotting them. And so the individual stills often are falling apart. This is a particularly legible one, but they're often kind of illegible, but then, yes. Yes, thank you so much, that's exactly. All right, how's that? All right, I'll, I'll, <laughs> thanks. I'm just going, so thank you so much for, did you have your hand up for a while? No, no, I just Okay. <laughs> um, but anyway, so this is, you know, making an animation, but then I'm blotting the drawings. So as individual drawings, they're often illegible, but then in the motion, when I put them back together, the image comes back out. And again, that's like trying to make work that's um, problematizing how we're able to see something, even. So how can you do that with painting? How can, how can, how can this, this medium function around this sort of difficulty or the fleetingness of vision and of understanding and of apprehension? Um, Another question is how, um, how images live in materials. And this gets back to you know, where I started about just being bored by drawing an image, brush stroke, brush stroke, brush stroke. And so from very early, this is also very, uh, this is a, from a long time ago. Um, I was circling these materials that had um, kind of relationships to the sources. So this is obviously a, a movie still from a Fassbender film. Uh, it's a photo I shot off the TV. The photo has this quality of glossiness, and I'm painting on plastic, on both sides of plastic. So there was, without knowing exactly what I was trying to do, there was this impulse to try to um, suture these things together. The materiality of the image, if an intangible and kind of glossy image can have materiality with the materiality of painting. Um, this is from around the same time. This was trying to understand how grounds um, how the ground of a painting determined the painting. So um, it's, a, it's a piece of plastic, and it's on the bottom is plastic, on the top is a canvas, which is uh, selectively primed. And I was mixing the same colors and trying to make the same brush strokes. So it was a kind of learning experience of trying to make the same painting twice, where in theory, I think I'm doing the same thing. So I keep breathing into the mic. But it ends up shifting in different ways because of the substrate. Because I think I was at that time more interested in the substrate of an image than the making the image, or a painting like this, which is, um, again, on two sides of a piece of plastic. There are a series of these um, meditations on relationships um, and how you can, I think you, I chose this slide because you can see here, I think, how he's on the back and she's on the front and she's actually painted very thickly. So it comes together as an image, it, it, it forms itself as an image, but that is an object, it's got this intrinsic um, disconnect built into it. There's a screen that passes through the middle of the object. And I was really fascinated by that type of, that type of embodiment, that that was not making an image on a canvas, it was somehow making an object that problematized that image. Um, this really uh, came together in these silver paintings, which are about 12 years old now, something like this, um, which uh, I don't know if you can see in there, there's a face in there. This was an important painting for me, um, and it came about this way. I was, um, this is Jean-Paul Bomondo, <laughs> who um, I love. And uh, that's on the right, on the right is a picture I took at the airport when there was a really pushy guy behind me in the security line, which turned out to be Jean-Paul Bomondo, um, <laughs> with his face melted in this, you know, with his girlfriend walking with him. Um, but really then I was in Berlin at this time and I came home drunk one night and turned on the TV and there was a, a brand new made for TV French movie with him as a barrister behind layers of makeup and this ridiculous wig and I took my camera and got this picture which hung in my studio for several years. It was a sort of like erratic object for me because there was built into it um, the shakiness of my camera, the out of focusness, um, the slightly oblique angle on the television screen, the rasterization of the screen, um, all this character design, all of the age, and behind it was this iconic face. And I was really struggling with how to capture something about that without doing the Richter and just copying the photographic qualities of that photo. Um, so I gave myself permission to do something really stupid, which is just to separate the image from the surface. So this was uh, painted, it's a pretty straightforward oil painting on the back of the plastic, and then I was mixing calligraphy ink, uh, like silver calligraphy ink, um, taking out the pigment and remixing it to make a kind of paint that could be a surface that would um, cause this thing to behave in different ways. What it, what it did that I was excited about is the more light you put on it, the less you could see it. 
and if you looked at it straight on, it was a it was a monochrome. But from the sides or in the dark, this face comes out in kind of unexpected ways. And I was really fascinated by the way that this image for the first time like really felt like it was in this object and couldn't be seen any other way. I would paint it over on the back so you couldn't turn it around and see it in the back. Um, the other thing that this did is it created a problematic surface. I had been using these kind of slick, um, you know, I've been going for the surface of a photo in many ways, and this was, this calligraphy ink would be too powdery, it would be too wet. This painting is in my studio right now. I um, actually bought it back from a collector because it was starting to rot and I wanted to see that because I had gotten it wrong. So this painting is slowly rotting on the surface and, and I like that this has become a kind of time-based practice for this, for this object. But it launched um, two shows that I did of these portraits. Um, so this is you know, just an example of a painting photographed with different lighting conditions and the way that this, the image and the surface start to get to a kind of tense relationship. Um, the way the image and the ground start to get into a different kind of relationship. These are painted on, on white mylar. And then, you know, in some of the cases, eventually the, um, the surfaces themselves stop being these kind of monochromes carefully applied and started be, being these kind of gestural interventions into the surface of the, of the image. Um, at the same time, I was making another animation. Um, and this one uh, was a similar project. I, I had been disappointed when I ran out of drawings to make in the previous project, so I um, picked a longer sequence and decided I was going to make thousands of drawings of the same thing. Um, and it, I did this one in 16 millimeter film. I transferred the drawings to 16 millimeter film and became more interested in the installation of this. I won't bore you with this. I can, I'm trying to skim through things. But in the show that showed this, you encountered the film strips before you encountered the image. And so my idea was that you really encountered um, this thing in its native, you know, in its, in its physicality before you saw it through the magic of projection. Um, and around that same headspace, I showed the piece again. Uh, in New York, I had showed it with paintings. And I was showing it in Germany, and I wanted it to be a different type of, um, uh, in a different kind of context. Uh, and I had all of these, uh, all these images of um, photos I'd collected of this character who was in the animation. And I wanted to make kind of a press packet, you know, those lobby cards you used to have at movie theaters. Um, but I didn't want to rephotograph the photographs. There was something about that that felt like too, everybody was rephotographing books at that time. There was something too known about that strategy. So I just absentmindedly started to see if I could draw the negative of that photo. So this was the first kind of photo negative piece that I made, which is a simple drawing on the left, um, just looking at the photo and trying to imagine what the opposite of what I was seeing was. And then on the right, just putting on a piece of uh, black and white paper and turning on the lights and, and printing it. Um, this carries me to today. So we're done. We can stop. <laughs> um, but this solved a lot of problems for me. Um, in that one, I found a way to work inside of the surface that I was so fascinated with. Um, and remember, I'm questioning here where, where painting lives in its materials. And I was trying to get into these materials of a kind of imagery I was interested in. And that surface was the problem. So I found a way to get inside the surface. And I also um, found a way to trip myself up because drawing in reverse is really pleasurable. And you never get what you think you're going to get. So it became a way where I was more interested in, um, I, I re-energized my practice of, of struggling with making again. Um, and it went forward through different materials. This is an example. I did a series of these um, uh, with uh, larger prints um, with oil paint and that kind of silver ink I was using. This really fascinated me because the, um, well, as you can see, the silver ink in the negative object on the left is white, but then the mylar is white, but then they shift in different directions in the print. So this is a way that the criteria of seeing for the photo paper was different from my criteria, from my way of seeing. And there was a kind of collaboration then with this different type of vision, with this different type of these, um, these qualities. And this uh, was my show at the Renaissance Society. Um, I had shown some of these photo works, and I got invited to do a show there and decided to really unpack this kind of blind date between painting and photography. Um, and worked, bought a lot of photo paper and worked in all kinds of different ways, making photograms of materials. This is um, a diptych where it's a drawing that I folded in half when it was almost dry, so parts of it printed on itself, so it has this built-in kind of Rorschach symmetry and an asymmetry, and I was fascinated in like, how that type of space could exist at the same time. These are some shots of the, of the show and these large photo prints that were very experimental and trying all kinds of different ways that these um, 
the space could open up and then I could find a, a kind of materiality of painting inside of this surface. Well, from an image on the left is a very small drawing, an ink drawing that I'm putting in an enlarger and I'm blowing up. So I'm using photography's capacity to enlarge, to, to, take, an, to take a little gesture and make it into a big, broad kind of um, butterfly dance. Um, expanse, the one on the right, is a, um, is a contact print. So I did a kind of raster drawing. I just traced a Xerox. Of, of, you know, blown up. So I really tried to treat the scale in another way. These were um, printed through canvases, um, and so the one on the left was the very first one that I did through canvas, where I painted the ground around this profile very thickly, um, put the light through. Um, and what I loved about this is that these these ones around the figure, when there was no drawing, you have this kind of nowhere photo space, and suddenly. It, given all my earlier interest in the substrate of a painting and what the support of a painting is, I found a way to put that into the photos. There's a kind of scale marker in the threads and the threads become a very strong presence. But then photography has different ways of seeing than painting does. So we think of painting as being flat. Um, the depth of field in a photograph is so sensitive and so crazy and strange that it has the capacity to see the painting in different ways than we do. And I was always surprised by these prints. So the one on the Right, for instance, was I was working on a series of these and made a very thick painting. So the exposure time on the left was 30 seconds or so. On the right, it was about three hours. And all those black kind of crepuscular marks were actually pinholes in the canvas that were invisible to me. So with that length of exposure, the, the light found its way through holes that weren't part of the image. And so it started to kind of corrode from the inside. And I was very interested in that, that sort of revelation and that way of working. Um, I worked with different types of materials. This very, this is a kind of like, worked with an ecclesiastical um, <laughs> supplier in Long Island and bought these um, very fine fabrics meant for the church and made the series of surveillance photos of couples in bed. Um, working with very thick materials, flipping them around to the other side. Um, it became the series of portraits mostly, um, which ranged from these very painterly ones, I'll say something about that in a second, um, to these very um, kind of deadpan ones, like the back of Thomas Mann's head on the right. Um, and then this is, uh, actually I don't really need to get into that. There's a, it's just that, you know, in, the, in these materials, there was something wrote about the developing of the photos, that everything stayed open you paint to a certain point and you stop and you go into the dark room and you can restart in a different way. And there was a kind of openness to the project that I really, that, that brought it back to life to me too. Um, but then I would spend three minutes running it through baths of chemicals just to get the image out. Um, so I got impatient with that and I started not putting chemicals in the bath to start with, but then trying to apply them with a brush or a broom or a bucket. Um, so this vocabulary of sort of gesture and liquidity um, in the developing process itself became part of making the images. So I would expose, I would find the exposure I wanted and expose, say, 20 sheets of paper, and then I would um, try to paint. But once you see something, once you, you make a gesture and nothing happens, and then 20 seconds later, an image starts to appear and then it's too late. I don't know if anyone's worked with color, with them, um, with developing and opening the way in the dark room, but um, so what I would have to do is train my body to make this, make what I wanted without being able to see it. There was a kind of blindness involved and there was a kind of choreography involved. It became, there are these huge trays. Um, this is about, it's a little smaller than it is on that screen there. Well, it's about maybe two thirds. Um, so it became this thing of, of trial and error and kind of working with this liquid material in this incredibly quick way, which became more about like how you threw your arm and then doing it the same way again and again until the thing came out the way that it was aiming. And then it ended up with this strange um, quality to the image, too, through the structure. But the structure of the ground also carries something with the image that you can't get around. So that's a detail where you see this kind of rasterization which is happening. I was fascinated by that. Um, am I going too fast? No. All right. I'm going too slowly. Holler if you get bored. Um, so I moved into color printing. It's the same thing. Um, painting the opposite of what I want, flipping all the colors in my head. Um, 
and printing, but this just shows you how, this is an example of a kind of later color print from a few years ago, um, where these are, two, these are two prints from the same negative. And so the one is stretched very tightly across the photo paper, and the one on the right is let to drop, to, to hang, to fall. So there's a space between the fabric, and um, it really finds a way to articulate the fact that that image is on this fabric and has this certain materiality and certain physicality in the dark room, which the photography can pick up in a really um, uh, ephemeral way. So a lot of these um, prints from this time, I was putting the print on the wall, and then partway through the exposure, I'd go in and I'd drop part of it or I'd move it. And so there's this way of just like intervening and letting the air billow up, you know, just fluffing it out so that you suddenly put air between the image and the, and the photo. And then what does that do for the space inside of the photo? What does that do for the kind of image? And that's something that um, I wish we could do inside of painting in another way, or something like this, um, which is throwing the negative down the ground. And then this, I think this sense of being really fascinated by materials and how they behave in time and how an image is kept in materials goes through now. This is from March of this year. These are monoprints I was making um, with watercolor on fabric where I was drawing onto, um, yeah, drawing these figures onto pieces of fabric with watercolor. Um, letting parts of them dry more than other parts and then folding a piece of wet paper around them and running them through the press, you basically create this tidal wave of, of wetness that tries to push the image and some lines hold and some lines don't hold and you get you print the front and the back of the image at the same time. But in the end, it's like, what, what do these materials do? How does watercolor hold an edge and how does it give way to water? And, and how can you find a way that that folds itself into the very quality of the image? All right. The third thing I want to talk about is what Ben mentioned, which is how painting can be a time-based medium. Um, I'm, when I was a student, all the art that I loved was moving image art. Um, I mean, that's not true at all. I love painting more than anything, but the contemporary art I was looking at was, was largely moving image work. And um, I think that really had a long influence. This was my very first show in New York, which was in 2003. Um, and it, was this show of simultaneity of all of these figures sleeping at the same time. And I wanted this sense of like completely artificial constructed time that was also a hint of kind of common space that the, the, the trans historical references here were quite specific. Um, this is one way that time has, has been present in my work. Another is, as I showed this image earlier, is process that um, I don't just make an image and finish it. I often make a painting that then has a life for several years in the dark room of finding, finding different types of expressions. And I'm interested in the kind of unfolding of a series um, through seriality and that type of process. Um, also, the time of looking, the tick-tock between similar things in the mind of the viewer, that kind of the seriality of experience is a kind of time I'm interested in. Um, and I don't know what to say about this. This is, this is I think, my most perfect time-based work, which is a picture that was destroyed by Hurricane Sandy. Um, so it was a piece that um, the floodwaters came and picked it up and put it back down. And so I've since exhibited this with, with videos as an example of the, the life cycle of a work and how, that's, um, how that can be encoded in an object too. How an object can be traumatized and then still, and then in some ways like actualize itself through that trauma. Um, I'm going to quickly mention that I kept making animations. Um, they looked, this is from 2010. You can see that those early animations, which were based on still images, just um, or very short sequence of film in which nothing happened, turned into kind of action animations. Um, I'm sorry, I should have done a strobe alert, <laughs> by the way. Warning. Warning. I always forget that. I did have a problem one time. Um, and these were, in some ways, similar to um, some of the strategies I went through earlier at the Renaissance Society show. These moments of pulling together these sort of big um, envelopes of different references. These are kind of like scraps of, from the cutting room floor, in a way, from the history of film and other, other references. Um, and you know, there's, that's outside on the side of a building in Miami. That's um, a, a big hall um, down in New Zealand. But the animation, the sense of working with time in these animations <coughs> always was situated directly next to the paintings. I would not it's, it, it's been rare when I've shown these things in separate rooms. This is one of my favorite versions of it, which is the show at the Tate um, that I started with. There was a large animation in this room, but it was just on the back of this wall. And all of the work in the room was 
um, black and white, but it was all glazed. It was all photographs that were glazed. And I designed the walls and arranged the space. So basically the animation reflected throughout the whole gallery. So there's almost no place you could stand where you weren't seeing some of the animation reflected in the surface of the image you were looking at. And as the animation shifted into these passages of intense color or back into black and white or went very dark, it would change, it would kind of colorize all the work in the room. So I was in this way that the, the room had a life, the pictures had this life cycle that was changing in front of you, even though they themselves were still pictures. And um, as Ben mentioned, my animations have um, come closer to actually being paintings in many ways. I've, I've been using these canvas type shapes and making these um, multi-directional kind of architectural installations in which the projection will run off the edge of some frames, of some of the screens, in which the materials are very, very specific. Um, this really came out, I started doing this in tandem with the color photographs and my experiences of passing light, passing colored light through fabric in the dark room. Um, so you can see this is show of Marion Goodman and the, the frame on the floor is a rear projection screen which captures the image, so it creates this perfect shadow. Whereas the loose linen, which is the sort of painting linen on the screen on the wall, allows the image to go through just diminished and so then the wall behind catches that. So it ends up through this sort of doubling and then there's an interior space to that image. And I'm very fascinated with that materiality of projection. And you know, if I'm interested in the sort of animated quality of paintings, what's the mater materiality of a projected image? Um, or this was a show I did in Tokyo where there was this huge window that dominated the gallery space. Nobody could seem to conquer this window. It was always like, it was a view, it's a view over a Meiji shrine um, and just kind of a tunnel going out to this window. So I put the screen in front of the window and didn't close the window. So this animation had this relationship to the daylight. It was during the winter, so the sun would set pretty early, but for parts of the day, the animation was invisible. And then as the sun went down, the animation would come up. So there was the idea that there's this 24 hour cycle to that particular piece, which couldn't be separated from the, the physical expression of it there. And in that show, there were these photos too, where I was, um, working with stable negatives. This is a painting, a black and white painting actually. And then making drawings with colored ink on gels that I'm putting in front of the enlarger to replace the normal gels used in the enlarger. So this idea of like having the light in the condition, in the, in the moment when the thing is made, it's changed and it can't ever be repeated. So I'm kind of generating endless stills to this kind of animation of this image um, with things passing through it. So, number four, <laughs> um, what is a hybrid form? Um, what is a medium? What is the difference between painting and photography and drawing? And I'm not sure that I really believe that there is a difference, but I also believe that there are these, um, these formats and structures that are built into the way that we perceive and we think about art that, that you can be inhibited by and you can work with and they provide structures for making meaning around things. So. Um, I think all of my embrace of the last 10 years of, of working with these photographic exposures has been about trying to find platforms where in a way, I call them paintings, and I call them paintings and not using a lens. Everything is made with a brush, everything is made sort of with painting materials to start, so they feel like very involved in the process of painting to me. But it's trying to find a kind of platform where these different ways of working can look at each other, where sort of photography can be estranged from itself and painting can be estranged from itself and maybe open up other, other types of interactions. Or this is a case, before I started working with color photography, I was um, doing the silver gelatin and I was pulling the prints out before they were done developing, rinsing them in different you know, waters. If you've ever done this sort of work, you know that the blacks in the silver gelatin print change drastically if you restart the development or if you change the temperature, or if you do other things with the water. So this idea of trying to make color out of these materials that were theoretically black and white, you know, kind of like flex black and white to the ex to as much as I could to make these um, these kind of narrow color pictures. And that goes forward into um, the color photography, which really started with this um, Joseph Cornell piece, Rose Hobart, which is a film collage. If you can talk about it. And then if you haven't done another piece, it's this wonderful film collage. But um, he made this piece with cutting up black and white film. And then when he showed it, he projected it through a color filter. And so when I wanted to start working, this is uh, 2014, with color photography, that was my frame of reference. That was sort of my homage to getting into color. So I started with um, working from black and white stills and trying to imagine this kind of Cornell color, this 
If you've seen that film, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But these are stills from the original film that Cornell cut up to make his collage. I went back to the original and found my own sections I wanted to work with and made these series of portraits, which were very stylized. And then it was like, could I make more naturalistic color? Could I find a way to, through a series of these nudes and bathers to um, deal with the body in other types of ways? Um, this was all about that red coat. <laughs> this is, um, I have to show you some of these images. These, so these are all color photos made by putting light directly through a painting. Um, there's the can, there's the stretcher. And within this, there was suddenly a space for landscape in my work, um, because the kind of color that defines the landscape um, suddenly made sense as a challenge. Trying to get that blue of the swimming pool was very hard. I was trying to imagine it's a kind of orange in the painting. And it's very, you know, it's a lot of kind of gymnastics to try to imagine what what kinds of colors will make these colors you want. And so when you're working with these images, which are all about the color, um, it became an interesting struggle. And then it also slid into a kind of abstraction. I found myself really um, working more and more with, with drawing on pieces of um, plastic and just putting them in front of the light source and using them to draw with in a way to try to make paintings. I was thinking about all the classic um, abex rules for painting, pushing and pulling <laughs> and working, you know, excavating into the surface. And could you make that kind of vocabulary? Could you make that kind of image from hand um, waving bits of color in front of a, um, or, you know, or a, an ink drawing that you've scratched away with, the, with your keys. That's what that we're seeing there. Could I, could I compose with the, with the, with the dark room? Um, so these are quite big. And go back and forth with more, um, you know, I continue to make these figurative works in the color dark room. This is um, staining threads of a loose weave of linen. So where some of the work I've shown you so far, I've, I've primed the fabric so that it holds the color kind of continuously. This is, um, these are just staining the individual threads so they hold the color in a different kind of way. Um, and this is a show I did last year um, in London, which just shows you how the animation and the abstraction and the figuration continue to sort of fold together in one type of space. Okay, the last thing, um, we're near the end, so don't panic. Um, the last thing I want to just talk about is content, because um, I tend to give these talks so lost in describing my interest in the materials that I don't um, talk about the content of the work, which uh, in a way I've avoided because it's shifting a lot from, from show to show, but there are always very specific um, engagements with certain histories or certain types of archives or experiences. There's a portrait of Susan Sontag. Um, and, you know, on some level, I also want to be, be clear and emphatic that I think that there's a content in this way of working, that is this way of, of trying to strive for a kind of um, embodied ephemerality, a kind of uh, disoriented, um, unstable looking. The instability of that, to me, is, um, is sorely missing in our world. I don't mean that we should be living in unstable lives, but I mean that we need to have instability in how we see the world around us and how we're constantly engaging with the world. So to some extent, what interests me most in my shows is a kind of politics of disorientation for the viewer, uh, a question of is what are we looking at when we look at these things? Um, how are we perceiving these objects? And then um, how that creates the kind of experience, which is, which is maybe more important to me in all, in all ways than somebody understanding the specific references in the work. But the references are, are often there. This is an early work um, where I was very interested in these non-scripted performances um, and the sort of scene around Warhol after he stopped shooting his own films. Uh, so this is Holly Woodlawn in trash, nervously picking at her face. So these are all moments from different sections of the film, but she, if you, if you know this, this performer or this film, um, she's a wonderfully uncomfortable drag queen. She's constantly scratching her makeup off and kind of moving herself around in this weird way. And I was in, really interested in those, those sort of unconscious gestures of, of problematizing the face that she's made. And so this was something I was really thinking about at this time in this body of work, were these sort of expressions of like, um, sort of ruptures in the gender performance there. Or another example, jumping forward, 
there's this long sequence which is about history when I was living in Germany. Um, this is a woman, uh, Hertha Thiele, who was an actress in the 30s um, and uh, was in two amazing films in 1932. Um, Legion in Uniform, which is the first lesbian uh, boarding school drama, and Kula Vampa, which is the only film scripted uh, by Brecht to be a film, um, which I had both seen multiple times before moving to Germany and was really expecting her to be this big star in Germany. And she's nowhere to be found because she basically made these films, um, was very leftist in her politics, left the country. In Switzerland, she couldn't find work as an actress because there was a lot of nationalism around the National Theater there, so she retrained as a nurse. And she spent 30 years as a nurse before coming back to East Germany in her 60s and, and entering film again. So I became very fascinated by the photographic documentation of this person's life and that gap in the middle of the lacuna. So these were a series of these photos, photo drawings, where I basically set out to make a, an archive of negatives of her life. So I just collected every image I could of this woman and made a drawing of it. Many of them were disastrous. Um, but in the end, I had this big stack of um, a kind of pictorial history of this woman's life. And I um, made a couple of shows around this project in different ways. This is at the University of Michigan, and it was this um, kind of Beaux Arts gallery. We made this uh, sort of picture gallery about um, this sort of imperfect portrait around this, around this image archive. And this, um, now we're up to the present on this. This is St. Louis, and this was a show I did uh, last year which was um, in the galleries, in the middle of the mid 20th century galleries, um, a sort of non-sequestered project space. So there was this continuity between, as you can see, there's Richter's Betty in the background there, um, where you would pass from art history into my show and then back under history. So the first thing about that show was engaging with the context. And so every sight line in the installation was related to what was in the room opposite from this obvious connection to the Betty, or this was, um, there's a Joan Mitchell through another door, so this, this work was made to sit with the Joan Mitchell. And this idea of um, a kind of porousness or a kind of sense of, of like the echo that runs out of my work into this context in all ways. But at the same time, I started working on this um, in 2016, right after the election, and I was really feeling traumatized and also feeling what's happened to the progressive project. Where are we now? I mean, the world looks very different now than it did two years ago, even three years ago, but um, so I went back to these moments that I thought of as being in many ways more progressive than anything I could find now. So this is, there were two portraits that dominated this show. This was um, Jane Birkin from a film from 1976 um, called Je t'aime plus, based on the song she made with Serge Gainsbourg, um, which has the most radical uh, kind of gender porosity. It's a project of real like post-gender um, love affair that I wanted to put back out. I wanted to put this out in this, um, in these works. This is a painting on chiffon. And the other character was um, Lydia Pikert, who's a fictional character from a film from 68 um, by Alexander Kluge, who, um, which is um, about a young woman who inherits her father's circus and decides to transfer, translate the circus into a, um, a modern media machine and runs against all of the German businessmen who won't have it. So it's this um, really stark, um, extremely angry film about um, economic feminism that I also was just interested in putting back out there. So this, for this um, section of the show, I made a series of these monumental um, copper plate etchings uh, where I was thinking of doubling this character, this kind of double vision of her but doing it by hand. So I would make a drawing on the plate, and then I would make another drawing on the plate, and then they would overlap in ways that were sort of out of my control, and then I would work with it. So that just to give you a sense, that's what that work looked like. And I was interested in, in this kind of contact between the, the copper and the transparency, and the sort of ephemerality of an image and the solidity of the copper. It was in a show together with some projections that were also sort of through screens, and so I also, um, part of those prints is we also printed the backs of the plates. So these are the backs of those copper plates after I've been dragging them around in the studio. And they were installed in this way where the, um, there was a wall that bisected the gallery. And so you sort of saw 
you saw both sides of the coppers. There was this kind of idea of like the print being allowed to open up. You see where the monoprinting that came after this, of printing both sides at once, was growing out of thinking about this project. Um, so I'm basically done. I just took some pictures of what's in the studio right now that I haven't processed yet. So what I've been working on now um, are these drawings, which are um, drawing with oil paint on photo paper and pouring the chemistry on it and then wiping off the oil paint so there's no negative anymore. They're just direct drawings where the oil paint is using being used as a kind of stencil. So they're out of control and I haven't figured out. I haven't there's not, a, there's not a group of them yet, but there's something there that I'm really interested in. They're sort of getting faster and more out of control. And then you can see that the similar imagery is, is popping up. I, they, actually, I made these this weekend. <laughs> I just, um, these, these six prints I printed this weekend um, from paintings. So you see I'm embracing a kind of double negative now and wondering what that type of space will open up into. Um, and thank you so much for being so patient in my, <laughs> that was a bit, um, uh, I, think, I think I'm paring it down and I end up showing a lot more than I planned. Oliver. Hi, man. Hi. Uh, it's so great to see all the work um, together. I, th I found myself um, thinking uh, of a couple of, actually a number of different references, but two that sort of stuck with me was the Shroud of Turin, and um, yeah. the movie Blow Up. Mm -hmm. and, and you sort of answered my question in a way at the end when you, when you shifted and talked a little, a little bit more about content. But it, it just occurred to me that in this sort of, you talk a lot about these, these various the mediation that goes on and the different the sort of processes that you use as a way of sort of understanding the passage of time and understanding the, the materials, things. But it also seems like there's or I guess I'm wondering if there isn't, if you think about the Shroud of Turin or, or the movie Blow Up, in both cases there's a kind of a trace of the truth and somehow you think that amidst all this noise you can get to some deeper meaning mm -hmm. of the content or that there is maybe some truth revealed in there. And so I'm wondering if like, then you talked about searching for that German actress. If there isn't also in the process of kind of trying to get to some kind of truth of the image also, or there's some sort of history of the content that you're working from? Mm -hmm. Is that something that you think about? Yes, I mean, very much so. I, I think I don't, um, <coughs> I don't know what your experience is. My experience is that when I think I know something, I'm always wrong. And um, <laughs> that's really core to my ability to sort of have a, a, a practice, is that I try to find these ways of working where everything is has the potential to open up. And um, my way of, of working in the dark room is I print hundreds of prints and then I, I live with them and they unfold, you know, they reveal themselves at different paces. And so I, have to, I um, what I, I, I basically learned to stop trying to judge in the dark room. Because when I tried to do that, it was terrible. To judge? To yes. judge, I, sort of, I, I learned that if I tried to make something and decide if it was the thing that needed to be, I was always, I would always just spin out. So my process is, is um, yeah, this sort of faith, I guess. I guess there's a kind of faith that um, uh, I could I could copy an image or I could, uh, you know, just print it out. <laughs> but I'm trying to have some other type of relationship with it. And part of that relationship is about not knowing for a long time and trying to let the thing um, flex in different ways. So I don't know if that's... Interesting. I mean, the threat of turn is is a often comes up, and um, you know it's interesting because I I've um, recently been doing a lot of work around printmaking, not kind of as a printmaker, but that's what I was trained in originally before um, kind of going to painting, and I realized that I still think entirely like a printmaker, mm -hmm. and um, that that. Uh, and of course, the, the Sudarium, the, the, the Veronica, the Shroud of Turin, you know, this idea that, that Christ made the first print with his face, and then in you know, the history of printmaking, that Veronic image of the, the holding up the cloth with the imprint of the face um, is such a touchstone. So I've been coming back to that with less, uh, less allergies than, than to answer your question at all.
but I mean, I do think. I, yeah, as I said, I think you sort of did answer it in the group. Uh, uh, talked about how it's. I mean, when I talk about, I said that when I, when I was looking at it as a student, it was moving image work, which is sort of half true. I was also completely enthralled by the pictures generation and that relationship to thinking about images and circulation in the world. But there's a kind of, um, I have a different position with that. I'm trying to find a different kind of personal relationship to the, the um, uh, I actually meant to mention this when I was talking about content, that when I said that the, the formal experiments and the kind of procedures are in many ways a core content, the other is a kind of emotional valence in the work that um, I do embrace that. I do embrace the kind of, the desire that's, that's implicit in some of the work and things like that. And may, maybe that's like, yeah. I mean, sentimentalizing a kind of pictures approach um, by hand. Thanks. Um, I was really, I, I was really taken by when you got content the, when you were talking about the materials producing content and how uh, you were you were talking about the instability of the image that came out of that. And, and, and earlier in your talk, you talked about the uncanny. But one thing I'm seeing just course through all the work that, that it seems to come out so much of the aesthetic of the photography and, and the, the sort of exposure is this real noir kind of macabre atmosphere that, you know, I don't necessarily just like attach uncanny with this kind of like real horror, horror vibe, and I don't mean that in a kitschy way, but like in this kind of shadowy noir atmosphere that just like is in, in almost everything um, other than when you get sort of more psychedelic, which has its own kind mm. of uh, uh, abyss kind of quality to it. But can you talk a little bit about just the, the sort of gen the atmosphere that's kind of arcing through your work? Sure. Sure. I mean, I don't think I can see it as clearly as someone on the outside can see it because um, I have different, it, it tracks different times times of my life, it's, it, I, I kept saying little things like, oh, it was very specific with the Warhol films. I was living in the East Village at that time um, and was trying to think about them. I was watching these films because I was doing a kind of history of the neighborhood I was in. And so a lot of the black and white work, all of that was made when I was living in Germany for, and I was there for almost eight years. And so, um, and Germany had the had Babelsberg, which was the equivalent of Hollywood, um, bigger than Hollywood at the time. And, um, so I think that I was engaging with the place through trying to understand its layers of history, and um, it's not really answering your question because there isn't. I know there also is an aesthetic, which is my my attraction to things. Um, it's so per particular in its atmosphere, and mm. you you kind of point into it, but there's just there's something about this real kind of shadowy macabre vibe, regardless what sort of. I mean, I know that you're sort of drawing off mm. of films that have a certain sort of somber quality. Yeah. But, but I see it as more um, or, murky, luminous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, I think it's sexy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, That's fair. But, 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 <laughs> and, it, and I think it's, like I, you know, I'm sort of horrified when you can say that, because one likes to think that, that one doesn't have a coherent aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I guess. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. It was. It was. Um. It was a work that. It was a work from the time when I was really um, pouring the photochemicals, and I was. Um, if you talked to me at that time, I would have talked about liquid image and liquid light. That there was a way that because of the because the paint became the brightness in the and the ink became the brightness in the images. I was very struck with this way of like being able to work with light as a kind of fluid and then working with the photo fluids. Um, I was really in that kind of headspace and never quite getting as far as I wanted to get. And so that was a work that had been framed and put in a gallery in the basement and. And then when it, um, when they told me it was destroyed, I saw a picture of it and I immediately asked to buy it back from them rather than doing an insurance claim. 
um, because it had done the thing I wanted, which is it had actually taken the surface, broken it up, and then dried out and redeposited it. So it had, the, it had intervened and, and broken and reformed the surface, which I couldn't have done myself. So then I started um, putting it into installations. I've never, it, it's, it's a kind of one-off, but um, I, uh, I used it in Paris in a show with a video that, where I wanted the, the video to, um, I don't know what I wanted it to have from it, but it just became a kind of, um, the way that my partner often uses cacti in her work. She'll like do a whole show and at the last minute she'll get out to the florist and she'll buy a cactus and put it on one of the objects and it always has a sort of moment of completion and I, I felt like the sandy piece became that for me for a few years where it, it did the thing, nature did the thing better than I, than I, yeah. Um, uh, jumping off what Laurel kind of initiated, you know, I saw your piece at a collector's home once in, in Connecticut, and I just saw it, and it was like a lightning bolt. Oh, there's Matt, you know. Mm -hmm. And and I wonder if the work is less about a kind of aesthetic, stylistic sense, but a kind of psychology that really permeates. And you know, you talk a lot about a lot of the objects being under kind of severe material or procedural pressure. Uh, and I'll also twin that with a lot of your subjects. The, the human subjects mm -hmm. seem to be under intense observational pressure. Like the camera's too close and too uncomfortable, and they, mm -hmm. they sort of turn away and they avert their gaze, but yet like they're kind of frozen within that moment. Um, and I wonder if there was some kind of parallel there, or mm -hmm. uh, speaking larger to a kind of resonant psychology that kind of threads through the work. Yeah. What's, I mean, what's a kind of, what's a visible interiority? Right? What do you, how does someone have an interior space inside an exposed position? Like the Joe D'Alessandro, I think that that's been a, that's one thing that I've often come back to thinking about. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I, I talked about the early work in terms of performativity. I was really trying to figure out what, um, what a performance was, and I, I, I'm not that interested in in performance in the way I used to think I was. I think that there's a different type of visibility that is present. I don't know if I have, I don't know if that's answering your question or I have the right vocabulary. There's a, um, well, two things. I mean, one is the reason I kept apologizing for too many images is that I always think that I'm showing like an incredible range of work. And then when I'm standing here, I'm like face, face, <laughs> face. So <laughs> some way, like, I get allergic to that to that sensibility when I see it in this, but it only comes, when I'm sitting in my room, I don't see that, but when I'm standing on stage here, I'm sitting like, ah, oh, stop it, stop it. So there's, there's, so I'm just validating what you're saying about the coherent psychology, but um, one of my favorite uh, essays of all time is this essay that Fassbinder wrote when he was um, directing Berlin Alexanderplatz, and he wrote about this experience of reading this book at different times in his life. And it has to do with his awakening, se awakening sexuality, but it's also that you know it's, it's a common experience we all have. Maybe less so in this kind of age of streaming and hard drives, or whatever. But the encounter with the work, it diff when you are a different person, it always mirrors you to yourself in different ways, and and it makes you visible. And he um, is very eloquent about, um, in a non-sentimental way, about how this book, like. like allowed him to see himself as a completely different person that these were, you know, as an adolescent in his early 20s than in his, you know, later making the film. Um, and I think that sense of kind of mirroring or of a kind of encounter with something and the capacity for that to mirror is a, is a core psychological hang-up of mine. But you're so resistant. And, and uh, yeah, it's Because, mm -hmm. yeah, I just, I find the work like really substantial and complicated and very, very different. But I think we see these underlying threads, which mm. uh, I guess for us gives us a, 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 a kind of place to hold. Mm. And, and I'm, st I'm teaching a, a big uh, painting class next year, like a kind of giant lecture course, which I've never done before. And I'm struggling with, with representation, trying to think about um, you know, what my relationship to representation is, because I think that I don't have, it's not, I don't have the core relation. A lot of people are really compelled by representation, and I'm more compelled by it kind of loop of, of um, I use the word perception in this talk, but that's just a shorthand for something that I'm trying to understand about my own interest in painting right now. 
fifties. sort of defies for me this kind of idea that well you know as an artist or as someone who works you you know you you, um, you know you you look at you know you consume influences and, and look at art but then you you gestate this and then and then you sort of evolve to someone who does work primarily it doesn't you know it doesn't so much uh, explore the, and, and anyway and, and, and I'm trying to find a way to ask this question, but um, um, how uh, how important is it for you to to be engaged in culture? Very. I mean, <laughs> it is. Uh, I you mentioned teaching, and maybe I think that was the end of my answer. To Ben is that question of sort of struggling with who am I and what's my relationship to image making that comes up through trying to teach was one that I had stopped having in in Berlin and it's part of why I decided to come back to the States. And I think that um, in fact to answer your question, I think there's this ebb and flow where you get to you can spend periods being completely passive, devouring things, and you spend periods making and that if you're not moving back and forth. I don't know how you would, how you would exist. Right. And I certainly um, went to Berlin to get away. Right. And then after the time, it was time to come back. And it wasn't about coming back to the same thing. It was about coming to a different time in my life where I needed to engage in, in other types of ways, be challenged in other ways, because otherwise I do get into a kind of silo of my own thinking. I don't know if that was your question. I know. I, just, I, it's, I guess I'm making more of a statement. I just, I wish. Well, <laughs> I try. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I I need to carve out space. Yeah, I do. I need to I need to cut myself free and wander. Other other people don't. Um, I know you all have a wait, is there See. Oh, sorry, okay. sorry, sorry, sorry. It was a this is such a wide hall. Yes, thank you. That's exactly right. I think. I mean, I the, the image I always have in my head is is um, how important it is to let go of things, 
in the middle of the process that you you can't you'll throttle the life out of something and so i always think about um throwing something in the air and catching it and when you catch it you've got a grip i mean like that the catch is strong and if it's like you the thing turns in the air and then you have to reorient like when it lands it's not the same thing it's turned somehow and i i i feel like that's how i work it's and that's the that's the role of of chance of speed trying to trying to work of blindness you know like try to find these places where i like which is there's the printmaker in me it's that it's that moment in the press right that there's that sense of letting go and then and then receiving that um yeah i i I usually say something like that so you you said it for me i think that's true Um, so i have a a related question so when i observe your practice i'm incredibly enriching for me to be walking with a hard sword but it's very much invested in precisely you know that template of the printmaker so whether it's the negative or something and I guess I'm wondering what your personal relationship is to you know, the so-called digital sphere. Mm-hmm. Um, get back to me, because <laughs> I'm doing this. I mean, I'm. That's what I'm. I'm teaching two things next year, and one of them is this printmaking course where we're trying to engage with the digital in a different way, not as make you know. Um, there's a there's a very strong digital presence in the in the videos that I didn't talk about. That um, a lot of the videos um, are uh, generating color and other types of rhythms through running different scans through different sections of different channels. So um, that's the only kind of direct digital engagement I had. Is that I felt like since I was using the digital tools to put those things, to, I'm making analog drawings and I'm scanning them. Um, the, the, the native color of that is a digital color space and not an analog color space. So I've, I've tried to flex that. I've really played around with, um, with what happens when you start to pull that apart, when you start to shift things. You start to, I, write, um, I write a lot of uh, codes, not the word, but I, I write a lot of algorithms and kind of macros to process my images. So I'll just, I'll have Photoshop open 10,000 drawings. <laughs> and fuck with them and then I'll see what it does and that's a way of trying to let the digital like materiality get into the work um, I know you uh, yes sorry yeah. I, it's quick I promise yeah. um, no, no, I'm, you're I'm trying to let you all go because I know you've got this like <laughs> this is like the beginning it's halfway through your process is fascinating and I hope that I'm following it right and I also appreciate um, your take on material and it's Good question. Um, I've been focused in the last couple of years on zero waste. <laughs> so um, the the show in St. Louis I did, um, a lot of the animations were made with the leftover material from the making of the paintings. I would save all the, at the end of every day, I would um, scrape the palette and wipe it on big pieces of, of paper. I'd roll out big scrolls of paper and some of the abstract passages in the animation or just those sections, this idea of folding all the waste or the um, the oil and chiffon paintings I've been making recently. I've only, I showed a couple, but I'm not really, I don't quite stand behind them yet. Um, but I, my process with those has been to work on a painting on this thin material, which is kind of like a silk screen material. So I'm interested in, this, in the way it, things filter through it. And I'll work on the painting at the end, I'll pour turpentine on the palette, mix it all around, and then I face plant the painting into that and let it suck up the palette. The idea is the painting has to sponge up its leftovers and then I deal with whatever comes out. Um, so I, it hasn't, hasn't made great art yet, but it's sort of where my head is, so it's not, um, it's not a, yeah, it's great. Thank you, okay. Yeah, we can talk later, John. Thanks. Thanks.